Hi there, and welcome to Crockett's ACT Math Course, at lesson number one. My name is Jim Jacobson, and I will be your host and your teacher today. Um, I've been in test prep for 11 years. I started way back, way back in the year 2000, and uh, so I've been doing this for a while, and I'd like to help you get a better score on the ACT so you can get into the college that you want, and uh, it all comes down to the basics of math today. So, the course schedule. Today is the introduction to the ACT math section, the, ma the math test portion of the ACT, as well as the arithmetic basics that you'll need as the, um, the basis for everything else that you'll be doing on the test. Um, you know, there are higher order things that you do need to be able to do, but these are the fundamentals. Um, don't, you have to walk before you can run, you have to be able to do the arithmetic and uh, uh, before you can actually do the algebra and all the other stuff. So we start you from the ground and build you up. Um, we'll get on to the algebra and functions, we'll be on to the uh, geometry and statistics, and then the data interpretation and the trigonometry later. So just know those things are coming in subsequent lessons, but for now we need to do this stuff first. It's important. So, and then every lesson is going to end with homework and Grokit practice questions. We've tagged each of the topics that we do according to the same tags that are on the Grokit website. So if any of these topics or all of these topics interest you, uh, you realize that you need to do some more practice, you have some uh, room for growth on some of these topics, uh, you can look them up on the website, create custom sessions that allow you to practice and target your practice on those particular issues. The math section on the ACT covers a variety of content. Um, it includes uh, factors, multiples, and divisors, so you do need to be able to keep those straight and know what those are. So for example, what is the greatest common factor um, between 18 and 81, or the yeah, greatest common factor between 18 and 81, um, or the GCF as we call it in the business? Um, you know, that's a, a question you could get on that. Um, algebra and functions, you have to know that uh, the absolute value of x minus 3 equals 5, what are the possible values for x? So you need to know how to handle absolute value questions. Uh, Cartesian and coordinate geometry has nothing to do with mineral water and has to do with xy axes and graphing. So um, we'll re-familiarize you with those if, if it's uh, slipped your mind. And um, then also reading and understanding uh, charts and tables. And um, for example, you might get a question that deals with um, a chart dealing with books and boxes and things like that. There'll be some information along each of the axes and then information in the middle. Um, you know, you're going, you may be called upon to notice trends in, in that or do some computation based on the information in the chart. So a, a sample question that you might get might be, what is the least amount of money needed to ship exactly 25 books? if all boxes must be completely filled and there is no tax charged for uh, shipping books. The tax thing is um, there because, of course, the test would no longer be standardized if you had to calculate in your regional uh, tax rate for book shipping, if you even know what that is. I don't know what mine is, so I certainly can't help you with that part. Anyway, you don't have to compute that unless it's part of the, part of the actual problem, and then they will specify a tax rate. Anyway, so, uh, content not covered in addition to um, cooking, biology, um, chemistry, history. In addition to all the things that aren't math, you also don't have to cover or don't have to learn or relearn uh, pre-calculus or calculus. You know, derivatives appear on the test. Um, you also don't have to do any complicated probability or statistics. There may be some simple probability, but it will all be uh, simple. So um, it doesn't get any. It doesn't get extremely advanced, but it does get tricky. So, um, but it gets trickier in the way the questions are formulated than in the topics that they give you. So scoring and guessing. Um, the ACT is a test that allows and, in fact, basically encourages you to guess. There is no penalty for an incorrect answer. No, sorry. There's no penalty for an, no penalty for um, guessing. So leaving it blank, you have zero chance of getting it right and there is no additional penalty for getting it um, wrong beyond that you didn't get points for that question. So um, it is always, always in your best interest to um, guess because then you do have a chance of getting that question correct. Um, even better is if you can make an educated guess. So if you can eliminate some of the answer choices 
or get partway through the problem and you know narrow it down some other way, that helps a ton. It improves your probability, even if you're able to eliminate only one of the answer choices. So, guessing is encouraged. And in fact, there are, whole, there are strategies that we'll be giving you related to doing that some of that educated guessing. So 60 questions in 60 minutes. For those of you doing the math at home, that's a minute per question. And now that's not a strict pace. Nothing bad happens to you. No electric shocks come through um, electrodes on the table. Uh, if you don't follow that pace, it's an approximate thing. Some of the questions by their very nature will take you less time. Others by their very nature will take you more time. And that will vary actually somewhat according to what you already know. Questions that are easy for you will take less time. So um, just know that you have to average this pace and you have to be able to finish and know that you can guess if you just can't get to the answer. Just put an answer down, move forward. So, um, and the questions do get harder as you go on. So, um, but that can be somewhat a matter of perception. As I was talking about with how much time you spend per question, the difficulty of a question will also vary according to your strengths and weaknesses. Something that I'm good at, uh, I will find easier and may spend less time. I may see a shortcut that I can do to make the problem easier. Um, if it's something that you struggle with, you may have to go a longer way about, you know, take a longer path, you know, path to solving a question, and that's okay. So just know that as they go on, they should be getting more complicated, should be getting harder, but it's going to vary a little bit according to your strengths. Um, the other thing to know then, though, is that since they do get harder, the more an answer seems almost too good to be true, too easy, the more you should figure that there's something going on there. Look more closely to make sure that's not it. Now again, if you know that a given topic is just easy for you and you see the right answer right away, uh, that's an important thing to know about yourself, but later on in the test, be suspicious. Okay. So an example of a question where you can do some eliminating right away is, um, here's a practice question from Grocket. So, and this could be towards the end of the test. You can still eliminate some of these answer choices though based on what you already know. So the figure to the left shows two concentric circles such that the nine inch diameter of the smaller circle is equal to the radius of the larger circle. What is the, di what is the area in square inches of the shaded region? So we would be subtracting the area of the one, so we'd be subtracting the area of the bigger one, or from the area of the bigger one, we'd be subtracting the area of the smaller one. That's gonna be some number, right? But remember that all the areas of a circle, any area of a circle, is the, the formula is pi times the radius squared. So every answer should have pi in it. Even if, even though we're subtracting one from the other, subtraction does not get rid of pi. Division gets rid of pi. So we can get rid of the answer choices that don't have pi in them just without even really thinking about it. And that's uh, two of them right there. We're mad at you guys. So you guys don't stick around. And so that, now if we have no other clue about how we would do this one, um, we still have a, a one in three chance of guessing instead of one in five. Our odds are um, definitely better. 33% is better than 20% every time if it's something good. So um, that's, that's just an example of one of the strategies that you can use. Use what you know to narrow things down and move forward. Again, this is towards the end, so you must have been doing well if you got this far. Okay. So, um, the other things you can do are evaluate the answers for plausibility. So in addition to eliminating ones that just don't make any sense, you can uh, look at them and kind of get an idea of what, what you're dealing with in the problem. So this is another practice question from Grocket. Of the 736 graduating seniors at Rockford University, approximately one-fourth are going to medical school, and approximately two-thirds of those going to medical school are going to a domestic medical school. Which of the following is the closest estimate for how many of the graduating seniors are going to a domestic medical school? And then you look at your answer choices and uh, C, D, E. And some of the preliminary thinking that you can do just revolves around the stuff that you can find out pretty easily. So we know one quarter of them are going to medical school. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to realize that one quarter of 736, and, and it's two thirds of one quarter, so it's not even one quarter of them 
that the right answer is going to be. It's some smaller fraction of one quarter of them. There's no way that it's going to be 500 of them, nor is there any way that it's going to be 320 of them. So we've gotten it down to three answer choices just on the basis of this whole, it's got to be less than a quarter of them. So from there, it, you know, it does depend on what you decide to do next. Um, you could say, well, you know, which one of these, we could say, well, what's a quarter of 736? So, you know, you pop it into your calculator or you do it on paper, either way. Um, so a quarter of 736 turns out to be 174. So uh, two thirds of 174 probably can't be this one either. 180 can't be two thirds of 174. So then we're left between 160 and 120. Now, if you're really doing the math, you could say, well, it's two-thirds of one-fourth of them, um, which is two-twelfths, which is one-sixth. So you figure out what one-sixth of 736 is. Um, it comes out to be 122. So one-sixth of 736 equals 122. And so A is the closest one, but even that, two-thirds of 174, 160 seems awfully high for two-thirds. So just on the basis of logic, um, we don't even have to do any math and we can get it down to the right answer. That's not going to happen every time or even most of the time, but tools in the toolbox, so this is the one thing that you should keep in mind. You can use your brain and uh, save yourself some work. So, okay. So another thing that you can do to make your life easier is to choose logical, easy numbers to do the calculations that the problems give you. So um, here's another practice question from Crockett. Jessica's sales increased by 20% from 1997 to 1998 and by 15% from 1998 to 1999. By what total percent did her sales increase from 1997 to 1998? So. Um, you know, and we get answers, we get 38, 35, 20, 15, and 10. The first one we can eliminate right away is the simple sum of the 20% and the 15%. That equals 35. Um, because the 15% increased over the 20%, you know, the 20%, it went up 20%, and then that new number went up. 15%. So we can't just do the simple sum of 20 and 15, which is 35. So that one's naughty. We can get rid of that. Um, so in terms of picking logical and easy numbers with percents, your buddy, your best friend, your BFF is going to be 100. It's not going to work on 100% of the problems, but on almost all of them, this is going to be the number to pick. So if, if, if Jessica's sales increased by 20%, and she started off with 100 sales, a 20% increase on 100 is 120. So that's why you want to use numbers like 100 because it makes the math much easier. The first step doesn't even require breaking out the calculator. So it saves you a little bit of time and uh, decreases the possibility of um, a dumb mistake. So, and then we have to do a 15% increase of that. 15% um, that one you can put in the calculator, calculator if you want. 15% increase on 120 gets us to 138. And so her new sales are 138% of her old sales, which means they went up by 38% choice A. So again, this would have worked had, no matter what numbers you picked. You could have said that she had 5,227 uh, as her sales, a 20% increase, and then a 15% increase on top of that, figured out what percent it, you know, it went up. It'll still be 38%. It's just that the math will be... Uh, so uh, save yourself some steps, choose good numbers. Okay. Bing. Strategy three, answer the question that you are asked. Um, I'm sure you've had this happen before where you've done some sort of problem in a math class and you get to the end and you are so sure of the answer and then it turns out you got it wrong because uh, the question was asking for X rather than Y or Y rather than X. Whichever one you answered, it was asking for the other thing. So make sure that you actually answer um, what they're asking, especially as it gets later, those, um, but really throughout the whole thing, just double check, read the last line to make sure that the thing that you, that you came up with is what it was after. So, uh, Pole Corp is making, and this is another practice question from, from Grocket, they're making a circle graph to illustrate the results of their recent poll of voters about the upcoming mayoral election. 
25% of voters support Kendra Willard, 20% support Steve Jacobson, no relation to me, 15% um, support Amber Tarkington, and 10% support Harry Fink. The remaining voters either expressed no preference or supported other candidates. These voters will be grouped together into the category Other Response. What will be the degree measure of the Other Response sector? So, you know, we get some numbers. It really wouldn't be a good test if there were no answer choices. So, um, answer the question that you're asked. So, we have these different numbers here. We know that we have a 25% uh, for Kendra. We have 20% for Steve Jacobson, no relation. Um, we have 15% for Amber Tarkington and 10% for Harry Fink. So these numbers add up to 70%. So they have 70% of their pie chart, you know, it's going to be... 70% uh, of it is accounted for, and then they have this other thing here. So it could be very tempting to say if this is 70%, the other one must be 30 and if you said that, you would be very sad because the question isn't asking what percent is remaining. It's asking what degree measure will be the other response sector. They're looking for this angle here. So once we know that this is 30 percent, we know that, you know, a circle is 360 degrees. 30 percent of the 360 degrees equals 108 degrees. So choice C. So choice E, and they will do this to you. They, if there's uh, some easy mistake like that that you could make, some, you know, solving for X instead of uh, for Y, um, you can bet that on some of them they'll give you that among the answer choices. So, I mean, let, let them fool the person next to you. Don't let them fool you. Okay. So answer the question that's being asked is always a good idea. Calculator tips, since you are allowed to use the calculator, it bounces onto the screen here. Um, so the easiest one, the easiest tip is be familiar with it. So, um, you know, don't wonder how you turn the thing on. You, you should not be wondering how to find where the square root key is, whether there's some other button that you have to hit before it to get the square root. Um, it should be completely familiar to you. Uh, if it's one that you've been using for a class and it's, you know, uh, one that you're allowed to have on the test, uh, uh, you know, absolutely, that's fine. Um, a brand new calculator on the test is one that you should spend a little bit of, you know, quality time with so that you know how to use it. Um, you know, know how to, to know, how, know how to do exponents, know how to do roots. Um, every, and the other thing is don't get too reliant on it. The more uh, numbers you have to hit, keys are close together and you're moving quickly, fingers moving fast, you could hit the wrong key and you may not even necessarily notice that you did it. So uh, calculators uh, actually are one way of, of introducing new errors that have nothing to do with your computational ability. You could understand the, com the, the problem completely and through a miskeyed entry uh, actually get it wrong. So, um, you know, if you can, if there, if there are steps that you can take to avoid having, um, having to use the calculator, that's good. Every problem on the ACT can be solved without one. You may not want to do some of them without one, but every problem can be solved without one, and any steps you can take that um, minimize those that source of errors um, is a good step to take. So, you know, do that. Okay. Oh, and uh, yes, sometimes it can make them more complicated. Sometimes there is an easier way, something that is just math you could do in your head, and if you do it the calculator way, you're going to have to do some extra steps or deal with long decimals. So just be on the lookout for shortcuts. Okay, so now we're getting into those arithmetic topics that we talked about. Uh, factors, multiples, and divisors. So uh, we have to talk about some definitions of things. An integer is a positive or negative whole number. So no fractions, no decimals, you know, negative one, zero, two, three. So let's get some of these down here. Um, actually, what I should do is reveal the rest of the screen. That'll make life easier. so that I can keep all of these at once. All right, so an example of an integer, um, it could be something like negative two or zero or uh, 327. Okay, so those numbers have no fractional components, no decimals after them, but they can be positive or negative. Note that zero is neither positive nor negative in terms of these, not examples, 3.5, pi, not an integer. Um, 
the square root of negative 1, not an integer, okay? So, multiple of a number, any number that is divisible by the original value. So, you know, if you have a number like 2, a multiple of 2 includes itself, of course, 2 is a multiple of 2, 2 times 1 is 2, but, you know, 4, uh, 528, 1024, all of these are multiples, multiples of 2, in fact, you know, but it could just as easily be 5, 10, 15, those are all multiples of 5. Um, the relationship to factors is that whatever the number is on the end, you know, the multiples, the factors are the ones that you multiplied together to get that multiple. So, um, 2 is a factor of 4, and, um, uh, you know, 5 is a factor of 10, 15, or 10 is a multiple of 5, so they have kind of a reciprocal relationship there. It is important to keep these straight because there will be problems that test you on these. So, um, you know, you don't want to confuse which way you need to go, whether you're going up with multiples or down with factors, okay? It's important. So a prime number, these are special numbers that standardized tests love ever so much. Um, prime numbers have only two factors, two numbers that you can multiply together to get that prime number. And those prime numbers have, the two factors that they have are themselves and one. So um, that's fairly rare. And in fact, the higher the numbers go, you know, so the higher the, the higher the number, the further apart the prime numbers get. So knowing the first few prime numbers is going to be well worth your while memorizing them so that you know them when you see them. So um, numbers that have themselves and one as factors, are there any even prime numbers? Yes, there is one and standardized tests of the prime numbers, standardized tests love two the most. So um, two is the only even prime number. Every other even number in the history of ever in the entire universe is a multiple of two and therefore not prime. So 2 itself has only the two factors, uh, 1 and 2. So 2 is special. Uh, is 1 prime? No, no, 1 is not prime. Uh, 1 is what's called an identity. Identities only have one factor. So um, one, you know, 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. 1 is in a class by itself. Is 0 prime? No, again, it doesn't have any factors. So Because 0 times anything is 0. So um, zero is not prime. Are there any negative prime numbers? Also, no. So the first few prime numbers that are worth memorizing then, because I mentioned that you want to do that, two is the lowest one, then three, five, seven, not nine. It starts to look like we're listing odd numbers, but nine has two factors, um, or three factors, one, three, and nine. So, th so nine is not a prime number. Um, eight obviously is two times four, so also not prime. Next one is 11 and 13. Um, 15 is 3 times 5, as well as 1 times 15, so it's not prime. Um, and then, um, you know, 17, and you can stop there. Um, you can come up with other ones later. You just have to be able to determine whether you can divide that number by anything other than 1. If the only number you can divide it by is 1, evenly, uh, then it's prime. If not, not. Okay, so good approaches to these questions. Um, two different types of questions relating to factors. What are the factors of 90 versus what are the prime factors of 90? These are asking different things. When it comes to the factors of 90, it's best to just make a chart. Um, I prefer to do this where you just go um, down from one side of the number and up from the other. So for example, two factors of 90 are 1 and 90. Then you go up on this side. The next one that you can evenly divide it is 2. So 2 goes into 90 45 times. And um, so then you can do, well, 3. OK, so 3 times 30 is 90. 4 doesn't work. 5 does, and that's 5 times 18. Uh, 6, 6 times 15. And then 9 times 10. So and you know you're at the end when there's no, there's no other numbers in between them that that you can do. So those are all the factors of 90. Compare that to the approach when you have the prime factors of 90. So with this, we're after specifically the prime factors. Now it doesn't matter which two you start with as long as one of the two is a prime number. So we could do 90 divided by 2, 
I mean, and so if you get a really big number and you have to do the prime factorization, it doesn't matter what number you start with. You can divide it by two a couple times if you want to get it down to something recognizable. You don't have to immediately see that this was 9 times 10. You could just divide by 2. 2 times 45. 2 is already prime, so we stop there. 45 is 9 times 5. Uh, 5 is prime, remember, from our list. And then 9 itself is divisible by th is 3 times 3. So there's the prime factorization of 90. And again, had we started off with 5, it would have worked out just fine, as long as, it's, as long as you're dividing out prime numbers. Averages. You definitely need to know this formula on test day. The average is the uh, sum of the numbers divided by the number of numbers. You're probably familiar with this, but the formula comes in handy because sometimes they'll give you an algebraic problem. So if you get the question like this, what is the average of 3, 7, 0, and negative 2, you can ask these questions. How many numbers are there? Why, let's count, 1, 2, 3, 4, there are four numbers. The sum of the terms, 3 plus 7 plus 0 plus negative 2, 3 plus 7 is 10, minus 2 is 8. What's the sum divided by the numbers? So that's 8 divided by 4, which equals 2. That's the average formula. So here's a practice problem from Grocket. A student has taken five 100-point exams so far this term and earned scores of 75, 76, 77, 88, and 85. What score must the student receive on the sixth and final exam in order to achieve an average exam score of 82 for the six exams? And then, of course, you'll get some answer choices. Um, you know, sometimes it will be, it cannot be determined from the information given, but it looks pretty reasonable. These scores are all fairly close, and in fact, two of them are higher than 82, so that actually already makes it kind of unlikely that it's answer choice E. So in order to do this, you can use that same average formula, even though we don't know all the numbers. So we know that the student got 75 plus 76 plus 77 plus 88 plus 85, plus some unknown number on this sixth and final exam. We'll call it, uh, I'm going to give it a, a capital E because X looks kind of like a plus sign, especially in my, in, in my handwriting. So, um, so this is six exams, and that average, again, this is just the average formula, the sum of all the exams equals 82. So, um, you know, we can simplify that a little bit. We end up with... Um, 401 plus that big E, that last exam, divided by 6 equals 82. Multiply both sides times 6. Um, we get 401 plus E equals 492. Subtract 401 from both sides, and we get E equals 91. There it is, answer choice D. Now, we also could have eliminated some of these answer choices here because three of the exams were below um, our average of 82, um, and they're significantly below 82, whereas these guys here are a total of six, nine points above the, the new average that we're after, since there's, since they're, um, the amount that the lower ones are, are lower is greater than the amount that the higher ones are higher, um, it needs to be a number higher than 82 to raise the average. So even just from that, we could get rid of A and B, and we would have had it down to C and D, and our odds would have been a 50% shot of guessing, just from thinking. So, all right, moving on. Weighted averages work a little bit differently. You recognize them because they'll be some of one thing and some of another, and it's not evenly distributed. On the previous one, all of the exams were 100-point exams. Um, you sometimes will get a different basis, though. So in a math class, if there are 10 boys with an average height of 60 inches and 8 girls with an average height of 50 inches, what is the average height of the class? So you have to account for that weight, that there are more boys than girls, um, you have to count for that weight in their height. So uh, the average formula, um, you, you have to distribute it. That's where in here we have the number of things that are in category A and then the number of things in category B each times what their value was divided by the total number in each. And you can expand this to any number of things. You could have, you know, a C. So it would be, you know, number in A times the average of A number in B times the average of B, number in C times the average of C, all of that over A plus B plus C. So in this particular case, we have 10 boys, number of boys, times the average of A, which is 60 inches, 
and we would add to that the eight girls times their 50 inches and we divide that all by 18 that's the a plus b in this case and uh, it comes out to be you know 55 um, 56 inches basically rounded up and uh, so this takes care of the fact that it needs to be slightly closer to um, the boy's height than to the girl's height and that's one of the ways you can eliminate wrong answer choices with weighted averages the strict average of 60 and 50 would be 55 the average the weighted average with two more boys than girls it will be higher than 55 so ratios and proportions so um, ratios are a comparison of two numbers and it can be expressed in uh, several different ways um, you can have uh, so we have our example here the ratio of four to five can be written as the fraction four fifths it could be written as four colon five or uh, written out in English four to five and you could have them mixed even within the same problem just be comfortable switching them back and forth as you need to uh, one of the things you can do is set up a ratio chart where um, you write the ratios across the top and then the real numbers across the bottom. So if you got a sample question like this, um, three sisters split the cost of a plane ticket. If the flight cost $360 and Mary pays twice as much as both Sarah and Pauline, how much did Pauline pay? So we have the um, actual numbers. So we would have um, Mary plus Sarah plus Pauline and so when when in doubt uh, not when in doubt um, whenever possible choose variables that make sense if you choose XYZ for everything you may have to keep a separate chart of uh, you know which thing corresponds to X which thing corresponds to Y which thing corresponds to Z so using the girls first initials for your variables makes some sense the only ones to be careful of are O because it looks like a zero um, X obviously because and T because they can end up looking like a plus sign and then at least with my handwriting anyway S ends up not being awesome because it looks like a five I mean I can usually make them separate but if you're in a hurry on test day making notes uh, you don't want to get them confused so uh, choose variables that make sense um, within reason you know with cautionary measures taken that you don't confuse yourself so um, where were we? Mary, Sarah, and Pauline are uh, splitting the cost of a plane ticket. So those three, these are the real numbers, equal uh, 360. And so this is the real. And then the uh, algebra, uh, we would say that, so Mary pays twice as much as both Sarah and Pauline, and we're asking for what Pauline uh, paid. So if we make Pauline X, or it could have been P, but you know, whatever. Um, Mary pays twice as much as that, so that would be 2X. And Sarah, Mary paid twice as much as both Sarah and Pauline, which means that Sarah and Pauline each paid the same amount. So 2 plus x plus x equals 360. So 4x equals 360, and x equals 90. So then when we fill in the real numbers, this is really 90, oh, excuse me, 180 plus 90 plus 90 equals 360. So just make sure you keep your variables straight. And um, a good general practice is setting the baseline as the thing you're actually solving for. If you need to solve for what Pauline is going for, do everything in terms of what Pauline, Pauline was paying. Okay. So ratios and proportions. A proportion then is just uh, two ratios set equal to each other. So it could be, um, you know, three fourths and some other, you know, three-fourths is equal to six-eighths. That's a proportion because they are equal to each other. So um, an example of how that might appear in problem form would be if Hal can answer four questions in 64 minutes, how many can he answer in 12? Hal is a slow bee, so we're not going to hold that against him, but you need to do better than Hal on the test. Four questions in 64 minutes, you need to be 60 questions in 60 minutes, so, you know, don't, don't be this guy but you can figure out his problem for him. So um, in this particular case then, um, we set up a proportion. Four to 64 is equal to some unknown number in 12. You can cross multiply, four times 12 is 48. So cross multiply that way, that equals 64 times x. Divide both sides by 64, we end up with 
um, x equals 48 over 64, which um, when you simplify it, x equals 3 fourths. So our um, diligent, careful, but slow friend Hal uh, finishes 3 quarters of a question in 12 minutes. So, you know, do better than that and you're on the right track. All right, so percents uh, appear all over the place um, in real life and on the ACT. So types of percent questions, there are three major ones and they all have somewhat similar wording. So first is the percent of. 20% of 50 is 25% of what number? So something is a percent of something else. In this particular case, you, um, well, let's cover these first before we get into that. Um, percent increase or decrease. So this, an example text might be due to increased fuel prices, the price of plastic raised 12.5% between 2005 and 2006. If plastic cost $400 per half ton in 2005, then what was the cost of one ton of plastic in 2006? For those of you following along at home, note how it changed from giving us information about one half ton, the price per half ton, and then the question asks us about the price of one ton. Be very careful, wary, watchful, whatever word you want to use, watch out for that sort of thing, because that's, well, it's a really easy way to get it wrong, but you don't want to get them wrong the easy way, you want to get them right the easy way. Okay, anyway, percent increase or decrease, something is going up or down. Percent change is slightly different. A car goes on sale for $24,000. If the original price was $30,000, by what price of the car, by what was the price of the car reduced? So there's a different formula for the percent change, and so you actually have to solve that in a different way that's different from something just going up or down by a percent. So, and of course you, you have to be able to do all three of these. Now when it comes to percents, there are some shortcuts that you can do. Um, you can multiply it by the fraction or the percent that, that things represent. Remember, percent is just a fraction out of 100 anyway. So, um, for example, um, you know, one half is the same thing as 0.5. Some questions it'll be easier to multiply something times one half. Some things it'll be easier to multiply it times 0.5. And you'll get 50% either way. You'll get the same answer either way, but sometimes the math leads you down one or the other path. Just be watchful of ways that you can uh, shorten things out. So these common conversions are worth memorizing. Um, some of these you probably already knew, um, like that one half was 50%. I bet you knew that, but you may not have known that one sixth was 16.7%. Um, it doesn't come up as often, but it can on the ACT. And if you have the spare brain space, you know, you're not using that for something else, memorize these, it'll make your life easier. Um, uh, sometimes much easier. So, um, oops, I don't want that on there go away. There you go. So if you get something like 20% um, of 50 is 25% of what number, you could do it one of two ways. So 20% of 50, we look up on our chart as if we didn't already know, that's uh, 0.2. Because remember all of these, you know, 20 out of 100 is the same thing as um, 20 hundredths, which is the same thing as 0.2. So, um, so you could say that's 0.2 times 50 equals 0.25 times some number, uh, multiply 0.2 times 50, um, and uh, you end up with 10, and that equals 0.25x, and then you divide both sides by 0.25, and you have x equals 40. It's also, you can also uh, cheat a little bit though, and say since 20%, notice over here that 20% is 1 fifth, we need to do 1 fifth times 50 over 1 equals 1 fourth times some number x. These two guys cancel out, so we end up with 10 over 1 equals 1 fourth x. Multiply both sides times 4 to get rid of the, this fraction here. We end up with x equals 40. So this side might be the one that you do with a um, with the calculator. This side might be one that you can pretty get out pretty easily just on paper uh, using fractions. They won't always be ones that are equally easy to do both ways, but if you happen to see the faster way, go for that. Okay. 
So we still have our common conversions here. So to, provide, to find the percent increase or decrease, you apply that percent and then add the result to the original number or add or subtract one to that to kind of save yourself a step. So what I mean by that, let me explain. Uh, so due to increased fuel prices, this is the one we just saw um, two pages ago, the price of plastic raised 12.5% uh, between 2005 and 2006. And then uh, and it started off at $400 per half ton. What was the cost of one ton in 2006? So um, the percent increase or decrease thing, you could figure out, so first off, we probably, since the final answer needs to be in one ton, it's in our best interest to up this. If it's $400 for a half ton, it's $800 for a full ton. You could figure out what 12.5% of 800 is. So you could say, you know, 800 times uh, 0.125, and then that ends up being 100. And then you add this number to the original number. The shortcut way is to multiply 800 times 1.125, and that will equal 900. So you can do it all in one multiplication step. If you don't think of it, that's fine. You'll still get the right answer the other way. Just know that there's a way that you can speed things up. The common conversions also um, might make your life a little bit easier um, because remember that 12.5% um, over here is the same thing as one eighth. So the $800 went up by one eighth. 800 times one eighth equals one eighth equals 100. So it went up by $100. So uh, sometimes, again, these fractions make it even easier than typing it into the calculator you can still use your calculator if you want to. If you guys are really good friends, you can hang out on the ACT. So either way, it needs to be 900. Inequalities. So inequalities are all over the place and important. So these are pretty, so you need to know what all four signs mean. You already know what equations are, right? Equations are the big thing with equal sign. Equations are equal. Inequalities mean that they're not equal. So this, this sign here is less than, so x is less than 7. That's how you would read this phrase here. Uh, greater than, it goes in the reverse direction. x is greater than 4. Um, the little line underneath is a combination of the greater than or less than sign and the equal sign, this guy up here. So um, this would read then as x is less than or equal to 1 half. And then this one, the last one, is uh, x is greater than or equal to zero. If you have trouble remembering it, different people have different ways of remembering it. I learned it way back in, uh, I think in second grade, as the greater gator, that uh, the mouth of the gator um, is pointing towards the thing he wants to eat. This is a gator, and he wants to eat the bigger number because he's hungry. Or she, I guess we can be that way about it. So the, the gator, the greater, the greater sign looks like a mouth that's going towards the side that it's eating. I don't know why I shared that bit of my childhood with you. I, actually, I do know why I hoped it would help you. So, and that's why I drew a picture of a gator with green teeth. Okay, good story. Thus endeth the, gr the gator portion of the math lesson. So inequalities in terms of number lines are graphed in a particular way, and this could come up on an actual problem. So if x is less than 7, less than but not equal to 7, it will be drawn with a circle around it, around the actual point that's like the maximum. So x is not equal to 7, it's any number less. So, and then it'll be drawn with an arrow. So the circle with the arrow to the left says this, this a number is less than 7, not including 7. Conversely, if x is greater than or equal to 0, instead of having the hollow circle, it'll be filled in. The arrow is still there though, so greater than or equal to filled in dot. Not great, if it doesn't have the little extra bar under the greater than or equal sign, you don't fill in the dot. So, nor will they do that on questions for you. That's how you can interpret the information you're given. So what would um, x is greater than negative 2 and less than or equal to 6 look like on the number line? Well, I'll tell you. So remember that, uh, and you can just start with whichever side you want, x has to be greater than negative 2, but it's not equal to, to negative 2. x cannot equal negative 2, so we can't draw the dot there. We have to draw the hollow circle. Um, 
if it were by itself, we would just draw the arrow going that way, but it actually has the other end of the inequality on it on the other side. So it goes all the way to 6. Now x can equal 6, so we fill in the dot on the other side. There are no arrows here because we have the two endpoints. When you have those arrows, um, that indicates that the line goes on indefinitely in that direction. So if x is less than 7, it's all the infinite numbers on the left side of the number line less than 7. If you have both endpoints on it, you draw the dots on both sides. Good story. Okay, so solving inequalities, you can do it just the same way that you would do an equation, um, mostly. So, um, for example, um, with one exception, right? So let me show you how you do these. So first off, uh, you can add and subtract things from both sides um, and multiply and divide on both sides of the inequality and leave it just the way it is. 3x minus 4 is greater than 14. Again, you want to isolate the variable the same way that you do with normal algebra. You add 4 to both sides. 3x is greater than 18. We added 4 there, both sides. Uh, we can divide both sides by 3 and get x is greater than 6. And, you know, we're pretty happy. The one exception, and this is really important because the ACT will do this to you. They will test this um, because standardized tests love this. Um, you can't multiply or divide a negative number and leave the sign in the same direction. If you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, you have to flip the sign around. If it's greater than, it becomes less than. If it was less than or equal to, it becomes greater than or equal to. So on this one, we have negative 3x plus 15 is less than 30. We can start off by subtracting 15 from both sides. So then we end up with negative 3x is less than 15. But then to isolate the x on the left side of the equation, we need to divide by negative 3. We can do that, but we have to remember to switch the sign. So divide by negative 3, 15 divided by negative 3 is negative 5, but switch the sign around, x is greater than negative 5. It's not hard, but you have to remember to do it or you'll get them wrong. So, you know, let this be a lesson to you. So here's a uh, practice problem on Crockett. Which of the following is the set of all real numbers x such that x minus 2 is less than x minus 4? Hmm, there's a thinker for us. So what are our, what are our options? So, um, and remember, we can treat this um, the way we would in, e in equation, and that's going to make our life easier. So we have x minus 2 less than x minus 4. Well, we can actually shortcut this quite a bit by subtracting an x from both sides. You can do that. You can eliminate the variable entirely from the question, and in this case, it makes our life, um, makes us able to solve the, solve the problem. We could, if we wanted to, add 2 to both sides, so let's just do that first, just for the sake of demonstration. We can add 2. Uh, adding and subtracting doesn't change the direction of the sign, so then we end up with x is less than x minus 2, which already might look suspicious to you. Um, and from there, we can subtract an x from both sides. And then we end up with 0 is less than negative 2. And that just isn't so. That's not right. Uh, which means that there are no values for x that actually satisfy this inequality. So our answer choice is actually choice A, the empty set. There's no values that satisfy our inequality. Um, in terms of these other ones, real numbers, um, you probably should know what some of these terms are. Um, real numbers are all the numbers on the number line. Prime numbers we already talked about. Um, non-zero real numbers are just real numbers that aren't zero. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Um, and then negative real numbers obviously are the ones on the left-hand side of the number line, to the left of zero. So um, real as opposed to imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers are things like the square root of negative one. Um, doesn't exist, so it's imaginary, but you can still factor it out of things, and that's why we talk about it. Um, yeah, anyway, so um, just know that inequalities may rear their ugly head on the ACT and just deal with them the way you would equations, mostly. So absolute values, uh, they're actually just a measure of distance. That's really what absolute value is. So um, they're always positive. That's why absolute values are always positive. The same reason that um, you know the measures of the sides of a triangle are always positive. You can't have a negative triangle, at least in this universe. So. Um, you know, they're never negative, although the things that go into them may be negative. So, yeah, da, da, da. so for example, negative 4. The absolute value of negative 4 becomes 4 because negative 4 over here, this guy, 
is one, two, three, four units away from zero. And four, the absolute value of four also equals four because it's one, two, three, four units from zero also on the other side. So four and negative four both have the same absolute value because they're the same distance from zero on the number line. That's the mystery of absolute value. So because absolute value can be represented as um, a range of values uh, on either side of a midpoint, sometimes that midpoint is zero, sometimes it's something else. Um, because it can be represented um, as a range of values, you can use inequalities with absolute value as well. So um, as an example, you um, could represent, so just to show you, you could use the equation, the absolute value of x minus two equals five as two separate equations. You could say that x minus 2 is equal to 5, or you could say that x minus 2 is equal to negative 5. Both are possible with an absolute value sign with the th on the left side of the equation. So uh, we have to account for that. We can also do the same thing with inequalities. So we'll have an example here. Um, and so here, absolute values with inequalities are, in some, in some respects, a, a range around a midpoint which need not be 0. So, as an example, here's a word problem that you could get, um, something more real world based. The height of every basketball player falls within nine inches from 78. So in reality, what this is saying is that 78 inches is their midpoint, and they could be as much as nine inches taller, being um, 87 inches tall, or as short, quote unquote short, as uh, 69 inches. So um, in this case, then um, we can express that as an inequality as well around a midpoint. So the midpoint is 78, and the difference between the actual height and 78 is at most 9. So we would express that as x, which will be our height. The difference between the height and our midpoint of 78 is less than or equal to that 9 inches. The distance, is, uh, the distance from 78 inches is less than or equal to 9. <coughs> Likewise, this can be expressed as two separate inequalities. So um, on the one hand, <clears throat> we know that um, x minus 78 is less than or equal to 9. And we also know that uh, x minus 78 is then greater than or equal to negative 9. So, uh, the range of values then, we can do as we did before with inequalities. We can add things to both sides without messing things up. So x, we add 78 to both sides. We get x is less than or equal to that 87 inches by adding 78. And over here we get x is greater than or equal to 69 inches because adding a positive 78 to the negative 9 over here, we get the 69. So uh, we can set this as a, a range of values with two separate inequalities, and then we could also express it as a single one. So we have 69 inches here. Um, that's less than or equal to x, which is in turn less than or equal to 87 inches. Either way, it's the same thing. So here's a sample problem actually from Grocket. So at a, at a, whoops, I actually need to have those values on there. There we go. So at a swim meet, the time is for the women swimming at the 100, meal, 100 meter freestyle in seconds, all satisfied the inequality, um, the absolute value of t minus 65 is less than or equal to seven. Which of the following times in seconds is not in this range? So this is where we use those two equations the way we just had on the previous page. So we start off with t minus 65, absolute value thereof, less than or equal to seven, turn it into two separate ones. Um, and so then we have um, t minus 65 is less than or equal to 7. And then we also have t minus 65 is greater than or equal to negative 7. From there, we can figure out that then t must range um, between 72 and 58. The answer choice that doesn't fit, well, 72 fits. That's not it. Totally fits, totally fits, totally fits. 57.3 is lower than our lower bound. And in fact, um, you know, a little ingenuity could have told you that the only two answer choices that really could have been right were choices A or E, because um, those are the extremes. And 
if 58.5 was not in the range, then 57.3 wouldn't be in the range either. So these middle guys were just there for show to distract you, or maybe if you didn't even read the question, if you just guessed without reading it, you might have chosen those. But otherwise, think in, you can narrow it down to two. So if you get this question on Crockett, I, I just gave you the answer and I gave you the shortcut. Anyway. So exponents and square roots, also something that um, you can rely on your calculator for them somewhat, but sometimes it's much faster to not uh, do it that way. Also, sometimes the calculator won't get you the right answer. So general rules. Um, so good general one. Actually, I'm going to get all these on the screen first because the answers aren't on here. Okay. So... General rule, x to the zero power, whatever x is, x to the zero power always equals one. Any number to the zeroth power equals one. Remember that. If you don't remember it, you won't get questions right. So you wouldn't be watching this if you didn't want to get questions right. X to the zero, anything to the zero is one. X to the one is just going to equal x. So anything to the first power is just whatever it was to start with. Adding and subtracting x squared plus x cubed, or x to the third, that's the same thing as... So x to the second is the same thing as x squared. x cubed is the same thing as x to the third. Those two together, x squared plus x to the third, equals, miraculously, x squared plus x to the third. That's right, it's exactly the same thing. You can't add two numbers together with the same base that have exponents um, like that. If it had been x squared plus x squared, it would be 2x squared. It doesn't somehow become x to the fourth. Likewise, subtraction, you can't do anything um, other than rewrite it. x to the fourth um, minus x to the third is still x to the fourth minus x to the third. Addition and, <clears throat> addition and subtraction are naughty. However, multiplication is not. x squared times x to the third um, is equal to x to the two plus three, which equals x to the fifth. And if ever you're trying to remember, like, oh, how does, it, how does it work again when we multiply two numbers with the exponents with the same base? Um, remember that it would be, so x squared times x to the third is really x times x. That's two x's there. So that's x squared right there times x to the third. Three more x's. That equals x to the fifth power. So... Um, that's why you can just add the exponents together, and actually that's one of the whole points of exponents is that you can save yourself the trouble, add the exponents together, and then have a shorter form of the same expression. So, however, multiplying exponents, when you raise an exponent to an exponent, that's when you multiply the numbers together. So if you're just multiplying the two together, x squared times x to the third, x squared times x to the fourth, you just add them. You just add them. When you raise an exponent to an exponent, that's when you multiply the little, the little numbers together. So x squared to the third power equals x to the two times three, which equals x to the sixth. Um, dividing, if you have a fraction, um, x, x divided by y, x over y to the third, that's the same thing as x to the third times y to the third, or divided by y to the third. It may help to do that for factoring things out or getting, you know, getting some part of it out getting um, two fractions with the same uh, denominator, handy for those reasons. And then finally, um, x squared over x to the third is equal to x to the two minus three, which equals x to the negative one, which, as you may remember, is equal to one over x to the first power. So negative exponents are not negative numbers. I'm going to say that again. Negative exponents are not negative numbers, they're fractions. Okay, so x to the negative 1 is 1 over x to the 1. x to the negative 2 is 1 over x to the 2, or x squared. Okay, so note to self. Negative exponents are not negative numbers. Well, I guess they could be a negative number if it was, if, it, if x itself was a negative number, and you had an odd power. But anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so a practice problem from Grocket. Um, if x to the fourth equals y and y squared equals z, then what is z? We want to know. So we can just do this one by working backwards. Um, so we know that z equals y squared, and we know that y equals x to the fourth. So z equals x to the fourth squared. 
And you may remember from just 45 seconds ago, when you raise a power to a power, that's when you multiply the little numbers together. So 4 times 2 is 8. Z equals x to the 8th. Answer choice A. Um, note the trap answers. x to the 6th is x to the 4 plus 2. Uh, 2x to the 4th, someone maybe would take that 2 out and make it a coefficient instead of an exponent. Don't do that. That's naughty. Um, x divided by 4, I have no idea what planet that comes from. Uh, and likewise, e, z equals x. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that looked good to somebody, but it's not that. It's x to the 8th. Okay, a few more exponent and square root rules never hurt anybody, and all the kids are doing them, so, you know, you want to be one of the cool people doing them. Um, the other rules you need to know, these relate specifically to square roots, since we already covered exponents. <coughs> and these are, like I said before, well worth your time to uh, memorize and have, uh, if you have any spare brain space at all to devote to this sort of thing, um, exponents and square roots absolutely um, are likely suspects to show up on the exam, and so having them at your fingertips will totally be worth it. So first off, um, x squared times x squared. Remember that um, x to the, or the square root of x is equal to x to the one-half. Those are the same, uh, it's different ways of writing the same idea. Something to the one-half power is that thing square root. So, we can use our rules of exponents rather than our rules of square roots for this, if that makes things easier. Um, <clears throat> so this is, you know, the x to the one-half times x to the one-half. And remember, when you multiply two exponents of the same base together, um, you add their exponents. So this is x to the one-half plus one-half. Um, which in turn equals x. You may also just look at this and say the square root of x times the square root of x is just going to equal x because you're undoing that square root by multiplying, by squaring, you're squaring a square root. This is the same thing as x to the one-half squared, which is the same thing then, when, remember, when you raise an exponent to an exponent, um, <clears throat> you multiply the, the two together. Two times one-half also equals one. So however you look at it, you're going to get the right answer. Uh, just as um, we had these before, if we had like uh, um, x squared plus x squared, you can't do anything with the exponents, you can't add them together, that equals 2x squared. The square root of x plus the square root of x equals 2 times the square root of x. There's nothing else you can do, you can't uh, get rid of the square roots or anything like that. Um, it's just the square root of x two times, which is what you see here, number one and number two. <clears throat> the cube root of x, and so by analogy to the square root of x, where the square root of x equals x to the one-half, the cube root of x um, equals x to the one-third power, and so it goes for any other roots. The higher the number, the less likely you are to get that root, but it goes the same for the other ones. x to the uh, one-fourth is the uh, fourth root of x. And so again, if it's easier for you to work with exponents rather than roots, you can switch these exponents, you switch the ex switch them from roots to, from radicals to exponents. Okay, but there are still some more rules associated with that. Um, and again, when you get something like this, like the, the cube root of x times the fourth root of x, again, I said that they weren't that likely to show up, but here one is staring us in the face. Um, again, it helps to convert them into exponents, which are easier to deal with. So this is then x to the one-third times x to the one-fourth. Remember, when you multiply the two, two together, you add these together, you add the exponents together, so that's x to the one-third plus one-fourth. We need to have a common denominator, so we need to convert them both to twelfths. This is x to the four-twelfths plus x, or plus three-twelfths. So the whole thing equals x to the seven-twelfths, which is a strange-looking number, but that's the way it goes. And then finally, um, so that's multiplying exponents uh, with the same base together. Here we're raising exponents to exponents, and here we, as before, all right, there we go, um, converting them into the, the more familiar fractional exponents makes life easier. So this is actually x to the one-fourth raised to the third power. And remember, when you raise an exponent to a power, you multiply them together. So one-fourth times three equals x to the three-fourths power. That's all there is to it. I mean, I guess I made it look a little bit easy since I'm the teacher and I knew what was coming, but uh, being familiar enough to be able to do this stuff pretty easily is key to the test. So obviously um, you can practice these as part of your homework if this is stuff that you need to brush up on. 
So practice problem on Grokit. You might get something like this, and I have to get the actual answers up. There we go. So if x is a real number such that the, the x cubed equals 64, and x squared minus the square root of x equals what? It's a mystery, at least for another minute or so. So first off, we want to find out what the cube root of x is. Remember that that's um, some number times itself times itself again. In this particular case, um, this is 4. Because x, so if x is 4, 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times 16 times 4 a fourth time gives you 64. Now we just have to solve for this part here. x squared is 16 minus the square root of x, and the square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. You probably learned that already. So uh, 16 minus 2 equals 14. So already we, we could have eliminated um, this guy and this guy um, just on the basis of getting this far. Even if we couldn't remember what a square root sign was, we could just keep going and still get rid of a couple answer choices. So choice C, 14. It is important to note um, that the radical sign, the square root sign, this guy here, square root, square root of something is always the positive square root. So the square root of 4 equals 2. However, if you get a problem like x squared equals 4, x equals plus or minus 2, because 2 times 2 is 4, negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4, because negative times negative is positive, you remember that? So um, just remember these guys, always positive, cheerful personalities. Uh, if you get a um, quadratic equation, you'll have two roots. They could be the same root, I guess, but it, potentially you have two different answers. So strategies for exponents and square roots, and I promise we're at the tail end. You may have noticed it from the little tracking thing along the bottom. Um, first off, these questions are notorious for traps. Pay attention. The thing I just mentioned about positive and negative numbers, or positive and negative roots, um, adding exponents with the same base or otherwise versus multiplying versus raising things to power. So just, you know, learn those things, have them down cold. You won't fall into the trap. Um, when in doubt, go with what you do know and eliminate answer choices that aren't possible. You may actually get it all the way down to the right answer just on the basis of what you can figure out. Um, so on this one, you know, x to the fourth, uh, to the eighth power, is that, you know, eight plus four or is it eight times four? And if you don't remember, you could even start writing it out. You know, you could say, okay, this is x times x times x times x, and that multiplied times itself eight times, that's going to be way more than 12 of them. So um, start to figure it out if you need to, and uh, go from there. Oh, well, there, that, that's it written out right there. So uh, that's how you can see that it would add up to be uh, x to the 32nd power rather than x to the 12th. Um, know your calculator ahead of time. I think I've said that a couple times now, but I just said it again. Really, know your calculator ahead of time. You don't want to be caught trying to figure out how to do something, do anything. Know it well. Um, positive fractions, oh yeah, this is helpful. Positive fractions raised to a power are smaller than the original value. So if you have a nice number like one half raised to the second power, one half times one half is one fourth. One fourth is smaller. So as fractions get raised, you're taking fractions of fractions of fractions of fractions, and they become smaller and smaller things. So uh, raising things to exponents does not always make them bigger if they were, um, especially if they were less than one to begin with. Um, this is the thing we just covered, the square root of 4 equals 2, but the square root of x, but x, the solution for x squared equals 4 is plus or minus 2. Um, fractions, negatives, uh, 0 and 1 to test particular statements with uh, fractions and uh, with uh, roots and exponents, because they do funny things, either in the base or in the exponent, because remember, x to the 0 is 1, um, and x to the 1 is x. So, um, and 1, the number 1, to any power is going to stay 1. So. Well, like I said at the beginning, there's a vault of vo Grokit questions that you can practice. Um, all the topics that we covered today, if you were following along, we covered each of these um, very essential topics for the ACT math. Uh, and more or less, um, these are more or less in order of importance for doing well on the test. So, uh, and you can do targeted practice for each of these, uh, the factors, multiples, and divisors, keeping those, um, keeping those terms straight is going to be very important. 
averages and weighted averages, you do need to know how to construct those formulas. Um, ratios, pr proportions, and percents are all over the place on the test, and so this is absolutely mission critical for you to understand well. Inequality is an absolute value, also important. And then exponents and square roots, um, this, is, this one is... Uh, well, I mean, you always have the option of just not studying something, um, but uh, I would say that this one is the most important one for you to memorize the rules for if you don't already have them in your head because of how important and how frequent exponents and uh, square roots appear. And square roots are, of course, just exponents in the other direction. So um, you can do targeted practice on each of these um, on the Grokit website and uh, go from there. Good luck, and we'll see you next time.